Okay, uh, I'd like to start uh, uh, today's uh, ISNAL uh, seminar. So welcome to the, this ISNAL seminar. So I'm very happy and very honored to introduce the, today's uh, presenter, so Professor Nicholas Koto from the University of Michigan. So um, as you know, the, he is very famous, especially on the uh, colloidal chemistry and you know, particle chemistry. So but you know, driver to his a lecture, so I'd like to briefly introduce, I try to do my best to make a very brief introduction. <laughs> okay, um, actually he graduated uh, you know, Moscow State University, and then he received a master, uh, bachelor and master course degree. As that, after that, he and um, then he uh, moved to the you know, Syracuse University, where the postdoc, uh, to join the Pendler Research Institute, who is the famous of the particle of science. And also, he um, became uh, an assistant associate professor in the Oklahoma State University. And finally, uh, from the 2003, um, he uh, promoted to the uh, full professor in the University of Michigan. And then, uh, as you know, he received a lot of award. Uh, so it is because of the time limitation. I just briefly show some of the representative you know, awards, including uh, Coil Chemistry Award of the ACS, uh, American Chemical Society, and also uh, award from the Royal Society of Chemistry. And so he sometimes uh, selected as uh, the top 100 chemistry chemist by the Thomson Reuters. So, and also he is now doing um, associate editor of the ACS now. So maybe you are very familiar with such kind of journal. So, as you know, that he is very active. Uh, especially in the nanoparticle science. And then today he will give a talk about uh, self organization biometric nanoparticle. So, Professor, please. Thank you very much. Thank you all. I'm sure we all have a lot of things to, to do to, to write papers and the proposals. And I very much appreciate that you decided to spend this afternoon here. Um, when I was listening to the introduction, I was thinking that the lifetime can, can fit in just a few minutes of, of introduction. <laughs> and um, I thought when I was a postdoc at Janoslav that um, as I get older, <laughs> I will have more things to say, and it will be more elaborate. And to some degree it is, and this presentation is encompassing quite a lot of works that I have done over the past 30 years. But to be quite honest, the further I work on a certain topic like self-assembly, the thinner, the fewer the sentences that I want to talk about. <laughs> So eventually, I think it should fit in one or two sentences, or better yet, in one equation. So that would be ideal. At the moment, I don't have that, uh, I mean, that equation yet, but I'm trying to, uh, to, uh, I'm trying to get to that. So, so an alpha assembly of nanoparticles. I would like to talk to you today uh, focusing specifically on comparison of the self-organization phenomena in inorganic matter, in organic and uh, the biological. And that comparison with biological <coughs> substances and, uh, uh, and units which are able uh, to self-assemble, uh, they provide the biomimetic uh, direction and venue for the, the, the discussion. I also would like to talk a little bit about emerging questions, emerging <coughs> directions in, uh, uh, in that field. So self-organization contributed tremendously into the development of physics and chemistry and biology. And here you see <coughs> only some of the uh, big building blocks which are capable of, uh, of self-organization. Uh, they include micelles, DNA, peptides, and uh, self-assembled monolayers, Langmuir projects, and of course, some of the best works and foundational works is actually done by some people in this room. 
and a lot of people in Japan. So, by and large, I think we understand the forces which drive the self-organization. And these are the various forces. And if I would like to uh, highlight only a couple which are only present in all the systems, which are uh, the Van der Waals and electrostatic interactions. And uh, uh, the motivation for further studies of self-organization uh, can, can be, of course, multiple. But I think in this climate, in literal climate, the self-organization provides the direction of saving uh, energy. And the fact that cellular <coughs> metabolism has that high efficiency is directly associated with the, with the utilization of self-assembly phenomena. Because they actually utilizing heat the, uh, uh, in order to build stuff. This is not how we do uh, a lot of uh, technologies now. It's some of them still are done by that. And uh, this motivation and the implementation of self-organization in the technology is not just a well, quite true. It's actually a reality which is happening now. I would like to give you the example of self-organization of graphene oxide platelets that uh, uh, Professor Fendler, my, uh, my former advisor, and I, we have done quite a few years ago. And uh, this is now extended in uh, the number of other uh, systems, in a number of other uh, methods, and eventually it uh, actually translated into the lithium batteries and uh, the energy storage and other technologies uh, which are representing multi-billion dollar part of industry today. This is not the limit. And actually self-organization can give a much needed boost to a lot of semiconductor and other uh, technologies by using semiconductor and metal, uh, and metal, uh, and metal nanoparticles. And for that, let's uh, look at a little bit what self-assembly <coughs> is and what is needed for that. For graphene and, and clay, we can understand it on a simplistic manner, but eventually, what the only thing that needed for self-organization to occur is just the mobility of the building blocks. That's why we need that heat uh, 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 in the cells and the mobility of the fluids. And that expands inevitably the uh, lead of the uh, units that can self-assemble uh, 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 in a very large number of possibilities. So these are some uh, of the building blocks which are utilized right now. Among them, the nanoparticles represent only one of uh, the building blocks. And yet they are quite special. If you compare what nanoparticle is and what all the other subjects of self-organization are, you will immediately see that nanoparticles are predominantly inorganic matter. And the fact that they are inorganic changes tremendously how the self-organization <coughs> happens and what kind of outcomes you have there. And let's have a look at those two forces, at electrostatic and uh, the Van der Waals forces, and try to understand first the differences between uh, the self-organization of the nanoparticles and all the others, and why this is essential and why this is impactful. So, uh, the, uh, the London dispersion force is, first approximation, is proportional to the so-called Hamaker constant, A1 to, uh, A1 to 1. Um, if we look at the inorganic and inorganic materials of the same size, of the same shape, we will see that for metals and semiconductors, uh, we observe um, several times increase in the 
value of the Honecker cosmos. If we look at the other case, at electrostatic, uh, um, uh, at electrostatic interactions, uh, they are in the same approximation. They are uh, proportional to the interfacial potential here. There are a lot of complex um, concepts encoded in this cartoon, but if we again look at the value of delta naught for the metals and semiconductors, we will see that for uh, that for organic materials, it's actually higher. So from that, uh, what kind of conclusion we can make almost immediately? That attractive forces, the uh, the ubiquitous uh, Van der Waals forces, are higher for semiconductor metals, and the electrostatic forces are weaker, and that leads to the fact that. Uh, the nanoparticles, due to their inorganic materials of the core, have simplicity in their assembly. And that includes the wide range of conditions and the wider range of particles that can be incorporated in the structured way, in organized way, in uh, the self or uh, itself assembled structures. And let's have a look uh, quickly over a couple of examples. Uh, of uh, assemblies which are normally represented by large uh, two groups. These are terminal assemblies and extended assemblies. The names are quite simple and, uh, um, uh, and self-explanatory. And let's start with extended assemblies, which are represented by the membranes and monolayers and many other systems that a lot of people have been working on. One of the great comparisons uh, with the biological systems can be represented uh, by uh, the uh, chain assemblies of amyloid peptides or a number of other supramolecular systems. In order for them to occur, you need to have a very exact molecular scale, atomic scale match between one molecule and the other molecule. If it is not there, then the hydrophobic interactions are not enough to hold it together, and the electrostatic interactions are not enough in order to form the chains. And the same cases of uh, virtually perfect uh, lock and key at atomic scale match needs to be in the other, uh, 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 let's say, in the other examples. For nanoparticles, as soon as we, uh, let's say, I came to, uh, to Oklahoma, I started working on uh, the system, and we found that for the very simple nanoparticle dispersion of cadmium telluride nanoparticles stabilized by thioglycolic acid, this is nothing compared to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the amyloid peptide. Uh, as soon as we reduce the concentration of a uh, negatively charged uh, TGA on the nanoparticle, we see the formation of the chains. They are structurally and conceptually identical to all the other chains that we have uh, be, be, be before. Um, I'd also need to point out that internally, we also have here the next step in self-organization, and that is the so-called um, uh, the so-called oriented attachment, when the particles merge in the monocrystalline structure, and that leads to a very significant uh, uh, technological <coughs> co connotations because that conduit of merged particles can now transform charge. And uh, that leads to significance and uh, methodological implementation of this technology in, for instance, the proprietaries and uh, printed, uh, uh, printed electronics. The same is true for many other nanoparticle systems. And just give you one more example of that uh, for much 
simpler and earth abundant nanoparticles. Uh, 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 this is self assembly of the pyrite, and now they form uh, the monocrystalline uh, two dimensional materials, which are quite popular now. The uh, orbital assemblies are, are also abundant. Uh, they can be represented by the protein cages of the viruses and, and, uh, and some exosomes. The first ever uh, type of the terminal assemblies, it was the example of micelles and the, the vesicles. Um, there are many reasons why we would be interested in the replication of the micelles and similar terminal assemblies for nanoparticles. If we look at the design strategy of, uh, say, uh, uh, surfactants which build this, the structures, they need to be uh, of high monodispersity and that strong and that strong uh, and that strong anisotropy to afford this high charge here and strong hydrophobic attraction inside. For nanoparticles, we would like uh, we would like to replicate it because they, they have very significant um, uh, properties uh, for, for instance, electronic uh, as well as uh, transport in biology. For uh, the people who are interested in uh, academic endeavors in this room, I would like to say that the versatility of uh, terminal assemblies and easy control over them is uh, one of the advantages that, uh, that, that I can give. And certainly you by now already expect that we do have some terminal assemblies and uh, the first example of these structures uh, made from semiconductor nanoparticles were uh, carried out for cadmium uh, at sea. They're actually in many ways ugly particles. They are of high polar dispersity. They don't have any particular shape. They basically can be made in the kitchen. And uh, uh, we observe that they spontaneously uh, form this monodispersed uh, 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 superparticle assemblies. And uh, in addition to the transmission electron microscopy, uh, we can appreciate their uh, monodispersity on scanning electron microscopy. Yun Chang Sha, he was very angry at me when I asked him to run the statistical analysis on all of these images. At that time, the statistical analysis was kind of a burden. It's not the case now. But now you can see how informative that approach can be. Uh, the red lines here, they represent the polydispersity and size distribution of the superparticles uh, uh, that assemble. The red lines, they represent the polydispersity of the starting nanoparticles. So after assembly of polydispersed structures uh, into 200 to 300 uh, containing units, we have reduced uh, width of uh, the pol uh, of the pol polydispersity. For the several days, I was kind of puzzled by that. Is it something which like a magic cluster or some other type? Turns out quite easy. So what we observed uh, later on experimentally uh, by using uh, the zeta potential measurement that as the particle assemble, they increase their uh, zeta potential charge. And that leads to thermodynamic control of the particle size. Just like in my cells, there is nothing uh, very different from that here, except the fact that the attractive forces are van der Waals and uh, the hydrogen bonding. So eventually, when we have the particle that would love to join uh, the growing superparticle, it cannot because the van der Waals 
attraction is not <coughs> enough anymore uh, due to the electrostatic repulsion. And uh, uh, that means that we can uh, replicate this kind of terminal assemblies for many particles. There is nothing special about can assist the device by citrate or shape of the particles there. We can uh, carry out the same kind of assemblies as long <coughs> as the particles have the same size, uh, the same charge for many other semiconductor particles or the combination uh, with the metal particles. So we start with gold, it has the negative charge, we add other particles which have the negative charge and they're attracting, uh, 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 forming this kind of clusters of virus-like shells. Uh, we, uh, uh, um, uh, we were looking for other um, uh, systems which could provide better choices and better engineering approaches for our colleagues in catalysis. And we found uh, the uh, assembly conditions when the particles form shells. The shell uh, conformation here is essential because when you have uh, the empty space inside, you uh, can carry out uh, the, uh, the chemical transformation in much easier and much more efficient way. In, in fact, the electrostatic and chemical conditions inside are much different. That's why cells are actually encapsulated. And so uh, th these shells are, are formed when the particle repulsion is actually greater uh, when the pH is higher. And so the reason why they form in a simple case scenario is because the particle inside uh, have high uh, thermal, um, uh, they, they, ha they have strong repulsion and they're, uh, 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 and they're expelled in the outside. One uh, of uh, the reasons why this system is also attractive is because it <coughs> offers an interesting opportunity now to transition from empirical um, description of uh, these assemblies into very concrete and exact, uh, and exact description by using the computational science and, for instance, the molecular dynamics, uh, which in this case was helped us by Dr. Uh, Kral. In many other cases, uh, it was also the, uh, it was also <coughs> the demonstrated extensively by my very good colleague, uh, colleague The power of these methods can be represented by the fact that this experimental transmission electron microscopy can be replicated almost exactly uh, on the computer uh, by the molecular dynamics. And this indicates that now we can transition confidently from particles which are designed on the computer to the assemblies which are designed on the computer to the technological systems which offer the properties which are a priori embedded. And this is actually very much like the nature uh, is organized and the comparison with uh, the viruses, which are also the terminal assemblies, is uh, uh, quite adequate here. We uh, have recently extended it to the more complex structures, and here you see the example of the hedgehog particles, uh, which are made from iron melanide in a similar conditions, and they also have the similar um, and dispersity. The complexity of these particles is quite amazing, actually. So each of these pores and uh, the needles, they represent the iron sulfide sheets which are rolled. So each of these needles is actually a scroll. And they form in one pot. There is nothing really complicated in breaking them. We just need to add uh, the certain degree of anisotropy and affinity of the particles to the mobility 
of the particles which is provided by the fluid solvent. Due to that anisotropy and uh, the uh, and the and the and the oriented attachment or at the edges, uh, they can form these chromes. So from that, the emerging question now is: you can see uh, that we can now form a variety of, uh, of superparticle assemblies and other assemblies. How complex we can go? How close we we can get? to the uh, uh, paragons of complexities such as these biological waters in the cells. To be quite honest, this answer is not yet there. I'm pretty sure that we can get to the dynamic systems which would be replicative of many of the functions of uh, the uh, supramolecular structures that, is, uh, that are represented here. The big issue there, and also the emerging question, is how do we describe theoretically uh, at the level of particle interactions in a more exact way that you saw before, in a better approximation of, of what you have here. So the problem here is that although we know that the sum of the, all the interactions, the electrostatic, the van der Waals, and hydrophobic, the coordination bonding, gives you an energy of the whole system. But the uh, problem is that some of, the, uh, of these, or all of these components, are dependent more than just on the distance between the particles. In fact, they are convoluted. And for that reason, we have to transition from the understanding of the system as additive, uh, uh, as additive or the van der Waals plus electrostatic, just like in a GLDO, to non-additive system. We have a variable contribution, variable um, uh, dependence of, say, electrostatics on van der Waals as the particle come together. This is a big theoretical problem, and there are no good uh, solutions there, now, <coughs> even for very powerful computers. <coughs> Maybe some of the people who are in this audience in the, in the, in the back sides of this room uh, have or will, uh, will solve it in the future. Um, at this point, even just accepting the fact that these are non-additive systems gives us a certain toolbox how to engineer them. And this toolbox comes not from the mathematics, the toolbox comes from biology because the interaction of biological systems is known to be non-additive for a very long time. And this brings me to actually the point of comparison where the nanoparticle assemblies and nanoparticles themselves are similar to uh, the organic and biological systems. If we compare the parameters of nanoparticles with those of global or proteins, we can see that the size, the charge, the surface chemistry, in particularly for water-soluble structures, are almost exactly matching each other. And this is not an accident. This is simply the, the representation of the fact that we're using uh, the best solvent and the greenest solvent ever. Which is a, uh, which is of, 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 of water, and therefore, from that analysis, we can simply state that the particles and the proteins must have some uh, similarity in uh, the properties and the behavior, and some of the functional uh, identity or biomimetics we can identify immediately. For, for instance, if we compare albumin 
and the cadmium telluride nanoparticles, we can see that they actually can carry out the same biological function, which is prevention of the formation of amyloid peptides. Uh, not long time ago, we also found that simple epics having zinc oxide on a, on a particle can form lock and key like structures uh, with uh, an enzyme called uh, galactose, which has the barrel in between and a couple of groups, and particles enter these groups. So these structures prevent uh, the function of uh, these enzymes, and therefore uh, we can inhibit the growth of bacteria here, uh, in this way. One of the quintessential, and maybe it's a little jump, um, of the uh, biomimetic properties of the nanoparticles is their chirality. All the biological systems are chiral. A lot of uh, manifestations of chiral uh, matching uh, uh, we know from biology. Let's try to trace those for the nanoparticles. First, I'd like to point out that uh, if the particles are tetrahedral, they are chiral if the, uh, the tetrahedron are imperfect. And imperfections of tetrahedra are actually very much built in uh, the uh, reparative chemistry of the nanoparticles because uh, the apexes are truncated. They have high energy and therefore they're, uh, they're actually not, um, uh, they're not um, of energy efficiency if the particle is formed with these apexes. And so additionally there is uh, chirality on the surface and chirality of the crystal lattice. And there are many studies of chiral nanoparticles. Um, I'd like to offer you one of the um, quintessential combinations of the chirality of uh, the uh, shape of the particle and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ionomagic properties of the structures which just came out uh, a few weeks ago. So this done. This was done in collaboration with Professor Shu Chopai in Wuxi University, and uh, we used the chiral cadmium telluride nanoparticles, just like what you saw before. It's stabilized by uh, uh, by L or T cysteine, and uh, the uh, fact that they are chiral can be appreciated from the strong circle of dichroids. As we combine that particle with a DNA and illuminate it with a circularly polarized light, the uh, spectrum of circular vectors changes tremendously. And it, it gives us the indication immediately something unusual is happening there. And after that, uh, two years was spent trying to identify what that is. And after that, it, was, it, it became quite amazing how uh, similar the nanoparticles are to some enzymes, so, so, such as endonuclease. What we observed, that the illumination of particles with light uh, in the presence of uh, 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 Salmon sperm DNA, it results in a scission in cutting that big DNA in two fragments only. And these fragments are constant. They are not just a place in that, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in that structure. Um, they are cut at specifically uh, uh, GATATC site. So that means that the shape of the particles, chirality of the particles, uh, forces them to interact only with that specific site. And this uh, brings them exactly to uh, 
their identity to the, and the nucleus and highlights uh, the um, uh, the biomimetic identity of the particle. We can also look at chirality and biomimetics from the side of uh, semiconductor and magnetic and metallic pro properties. And this uh, work can be, um, or this point can be um, uh, highlighted by uh, the chiral uh, cobalt uh, oxide nanoparticles. They are very small, about two nanometers in size, and they also give a very rich a circular dichroism. These bands, uh, they correspond to the core of the nanoparticles, and as we go to the uh, uh, shorter wavelength, uh, they correspond to uh, the charge transfer from metal to, uh, uh, to ligand in different configurations. And so, uh, the uniqueness of this system is the fact is the fact that not only that we have the chiral ligands at the interface, the core, the crystal lattice of the nanoparticle changes its uh, configuration and becomes chiral. It can be identified <coughs> by Raman optical activity um, uh, spectrum. We have the band which corresponds uh, to the uh, Phonons vibration in the cobalt oxide at 365 centimeters. This was done uh, by Professor Renati. Uh, and this band indicates that this is not your normal cobalt oxide. This is uh, the cobalt oxide which uh, have been uh, twisted by L16 and D16, which can be again confirmed, <coughs> verified, engineered by the computational scientist. And in this case, it was uh, uh, Professor Andre, uh, uh, Professor Andre, uh, Moura, and we saw that as soon as we add L16 to the surface of cobalt oxide cluster, we see the screw dislocation uh, that emerges here. If, uh, if L16 is in this direction, if D16 is in that direction. One of the very interesting uh, point of coincidence between the proteins and nanoparticles can be uh, uh, identified by the use of the so-called Ramachandran plots, which are uh, used to, uh, to look at the conformations of, of the proteins. They are certainly applicable here and indicate of uh, the same uh, screw dislocation of the same distortions as we observe for a lot of proteins. Why this is important for, from the technological standpoint? because uh, by uh, connecting these nanoparticles into the chains and uh, making the hybrid materials, like hybrid materials in many instances, we can form the transparent gels. The particles have the uh, have distinct, have di distinct uh, paramagnetic properties. And as we apply electrical field along a K vector of the light, we observe very strong change in the transparency of the, uh, of the <laughs> materials. So this is the translation into the magneto-optical and chiromagnetic materials, uh, which uh, can be observed by the, uh, by the modulation of transparency of these gels by application of the magnetic field. This high fidelity and high range, for instance, for other uh, magnetochiral materials, this would be just a half of the percent or much smaller in transmission and in fluorescence is indicative of their <coughs> significance uh, for information technologies. And there are many other reasons 
why it could be a competitor for the liquid crystal technologies that we have right now. Quickly, about assemblies of the chiral part. If we're talking about a symmetry, we have to look at the assemblies of the, of the chiral particles in this kind of helical structure. Not a lot of new concept, the same. So Van der Waals interaction, electrostatic repulsion, as soon as we slow them down, as soon as we, as soon as we reduce the electrostatic repulsion, the particles form uh, this, uh, uh, this chain-like, or in this case, it's fibril-like, or twisted ribbon-like structures. They are chiral. At that time, we used, uh, we used only thioglycolic acid as a, as a stabilizer. And we were not able to have a bias in chirality. So it's either uh, equal number of left and right helices or, uh, or no helices at all. And certainly, as soon as we're looking into, say, collagen and other biological structures, we want to have specific helicity. It's also important uh, for all the uh, polarization spectroscopy and hyperspectral imaging and uh, for information technologies. And it was obtained. So we used here the racemic dispersion of thioglycolic acid stabilized cadmium T particles and illuminated it with, uh, uh, with left and right circularly polarized light. So what's happening here? The dispersion has no circular dichroism at all. It has chiral particles there, but the number of left and right particles here is equal. We uh, illuminate them with chiral photons, and as the result of that, we translate the chirality of the photons, left and right uh, photons into the chirality of the matter. So if we use the left photons, we have the left twisted ribbons, right photos, um, the photons, the right twisted ribbons. And we can identify it with certainty by using the uh, transmission electron microscopy uh, tomography, which was done in collaboration with Pei Jun Jiang. So um, the identification of the shape uh, was done uh, um, in, in multiple ways. And I again asked my students, in this case it was uh, to carry out the statistical analysis here. Again, it was tremendously significant and informative. So we saw that the the, the, uh, the, uh, the dominance of the twisted ribbons of one chirality over the other chirality is about one order of magnitude or more higher than uh, the similar cases for organic matter uh, which are illuminated by the chiral photons. Why is that? Because we are illuminating in the Benga the absorption is intense, but also because we uh, are using here a different type of mechanism. So if, for instance, we illuminate with R photons, uh, which are uh, having that kind of polarization, we, uh, uh, we carry out oxidation of the nanoparticles. So this shell of thioglycolic acid, which has the negative charge, it's cut off at this interface between the nanoparticles and the stabilizer, and the particles start attracting to each other. This is the result of multiple absorption of photons. So the effect can be multiplied 100 times. And for that reason, when uh, the particles assemble, they assemble in uh, the chiral structures, and, uh, which can be again confirmed by the molecular dynamics. So what kind of emerging uh, questions uh, come from that? For a long time, 
I was trying to avoid the question of Homo carality on Earth and uh, the life origin on Earth. And maybe it's not a very important question at all, because who knows what happened then? And we'll never know. There is no experiment that we can run in the lab in our lifetime which would answer yes or no, it was that mechanism or not. But some mechanism is kind of jumping at you immediately when uh, we are looking at the, the, the data that early stars had circularly polarized light. So the dust particles which formed Earth and you and I are simply dust particles long time ago uh, had been illuminated with a light which had uh, the color of photons and therefore they could have stored stored uh, their uh, reality of these photons. The other interesting uh, emerging academic question here is related to how does the correlative transfer from molecular scale into the larger scale. We know it does, we just don't have a very consistent method to trace it, and nanoparticle offer that. And of course there are plenty of opportunities for, uh, for the chiral catalysis, and um, they are, uh, are being utilized now. And some of the works uh, that you saw on the catalysis of DNA is the representative of that. These are the smart, hardworking people who are far away. I am representing them to you. And my pleasure to be a part of this space. And I'd like to send them thanks and, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, and my gratefulness. And of course, to these folks who paid for this funding. So thank you all. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have.